Hi, it's Paul Anderson, and this is Science and Engineering Practice 7, Engaging an Argument from Evidence. When I see the word argument, I tend to think of the word fighting, like they're having a fight where there's a clear winner and a loser. But that's not what this practice is really about, because argument is important in science and engineering, because what it gives us in science is the best explanation for how the universe works, and in engineering, it gives us the best solution. And so to understand argumentation, we should look through uh, a little bit of history, a history of science. And let's look at the universe. So in the 1500s and 1600s, there was much debate over what the universe was like, what it looked like, and what accounted for the movement of the sun through the sky and the movement of the planets. And there were basically two models. There was the geocentric model, and that was this idea that the Earth sits at the center of the universe, and then the sun and the planets move around that. And there was a real elaborate Ptolemaic system that explained how these planets moved. And then the new theory was this heliocentric theory, the idea that the sun sits at the center of our universe, or really the solar system, System, and then the planets move around that. And so it wasn't as simple as one of these is right or one of these are wrong. We have to gather a huge amount of evidence. We have to formulate arguments and then critique other arguments. And so let me show you how intense this was. And so the, the geocentric model had been developed by the Greeks and basically put the Earth at the center, and then the Sun would move around that, and the planets would move around that. When you look at this model, it looks kind of crazy, but that's explaining why the planets will show what's called retrograde motion. They'll move through the sky, and then they'll move back. And so basically, if we run that uh, forward in time, the geocentric model explained these two things, why the Sun looked the way it did and explained why Mars would go forward in the sky and then would tend to go backward in the sky for a little bit. And that's the geocentric model. And that was really important, just fundamentally putting us at the center of the universe. There was something compelling about that. What's the heliocentric model? Well, basically that puts it the sun at the center and then the idea that the Earth and Mars are gonna move around the sun. And so these are two competing models. The first one was developed by uh, Ptolemy, and so this is a Greek, and, um, and beautiful diagrams and maps and formulas to explain how everything moved. But what they didn't have was a lot of evidence. And so the first one to put forward an idea of a heliocentric model was uh, Copernicus, Nicholas Copernicus. And so we sometimes call it the Copernican Revolution uh, by putting the sun at the center. And so he really started the ball rolling, but it wasn't until we gathered more data. And so Galileo used his telescope to, for example, study Venus. Um, and looking at the phases of Venus to figure out that maybe the heliocentric model was correct. And then uh, it was kind of finished up by Isaac Newton, who explained why the heliocentric model was right and the geocentric wasn't. But it took, you know, um, the church hundreds of years even to apologize to Galileo uh, because he was imprisoned for these thoughts. And so again, the nice thing about science is that there is a right answer, and we were able to march forward to that through argumentation. And so how does that play out in current science? Well, it, there's basically informal and formal arguments that are taking place. And so an example of an informal argument would just be people talking. And so here are two famous scientists. This is Albert Einstein and Niels Bohr. And what they're discussing is uh, quantum theory, these new ideas like Heisenberg's uncertainty principle that explain the way um, improvements upon even Isaac Newton's idea of, of uh, how the universe works. And Einstein wasn't convinced and he just kept coming up with good arguments and then Niels Bohr would try to prove him wrong. Um, as we look back on it, Einstein was, a, uh, was really, really smart and it was important that he put forward all of these arguments because it helped develop quantum theory as we see it today. Or maybe you're a scientist and you go to a national symposium. So if you're a, a biochemist and you're going to a national symposium, you get to meet with other scientists, share your research, hear presentations. And so what you're doing is putting forward ideas and then you're sharing those ideas with others. Or even in your lab, sharing ideas of what you're doing, what you think, uh, explanations that you might have. I worked at a uh, lab for a couple of sum summers and we worked on biofilms and every week we would have a meeting where we would talk about all the research that was going on and we'd share ideas. It's very important these informal arguments that you have in science and in engineering. We also have what are called formal arguments and this usually comes in the form of peer review. And so the way science works is that people come up with explanations or theories, they're tested, they gather evidence, and then uh, when they're done, they try to publish that in one of the respected journals like Science or Nature. 
But you don't just get to publish an article in Nature. You have to have it peer-reviewed. And so basically you submit your request to one of these magazines and then they're going to send out investigators to actually try to replicate what you did to make sure that this is a valid experiment. And a lot of scientists are trying to prove you right or wrong. So that's the way that science works, that we are really looking at the evidence that's collected and then we're re-evaluating it. Um, and that's the way that science grows over time, or really through these studies that are submitted to journals and then this body of science just gets bigger and bigger and bigger over time. Now in engineering we see the same thing. Argumentation is super important. A great example of this, I don't know, you may have seen this, is Apollo 13. It's a wonderful movie, but it, it details this trip to the moon uh, that was somewhat flawed. And so let's listen to, um, this is coming from, they're communicating with Houston. Um, they've just heard a huge bang and their sensors are going crazy. Okay, Houston, right, we've had a problem here. This is Houston, say again, please. Uh, Houston, we've had a problem. We've had a main B bus undervolt. Roger, main B undervolt. Okay, stand by, 13, we're looking at it. Okay, so what they had was an explosion of an oxygen tank on uh, the service module and they had to eventually move over to this lunar module so they could survive and it presented engineers with all of these new problems that they hadn't really had to deal with before one of the big ones is that the scrubbers the things that get rid of carbon dioxide in the service module didn't fit in the lunar module and so they had to come up with a solution to this problem and so when they really say Houston we have a problem that's what engineers deal with they deal with problems and they come up with solutions and they eventually took you know inventory of everything that was available to the astronauts and then they came up with a plan a way to build I think they call it a mailbox this way that we could really put a put a square peg into a, a circular hole and so um, engineering again is using uh, explanations and using argumentation to come up with the best design. And so what's the goal in science education? We want our students to be able to construct arguments, critique other people's arguments, and then understand this whole idea of science and how peer review is super important. And so what kind of a progression should you use in the classroom from elementary to high school? How do we get kids doing this? How do we get them using argumentation from evidence? And how do we get better and better over time or closer and closer to the bullseye? Well, we want to start in the beginning. And you can the best place to start when you're dealing with science is with a really good question. And so let's say we have a, a half a gallon of milk right here and I were to take a nail and I were to pop three holes in the side of this full container of milk. Now milk is going to come squirting out but a good question you could ask your students is what is that milk going to look like when it comes squirting out the side of that milk container? And so what you want them to do are to construct arguments. You want them to come up with a solution and then we use evidence to actually critique each other's arguments. And so when I've asked this question in class, there are basically three um, theories or three, excuse me, explanations that are put forward. First one is this, the idea that these streams of milk will all converge at one point. There's another one I like to call the rainbow hypothesis, that they're going to form a some kind of an arc like this and finally there is C where you're gonna get almost a cascade like that and so the first thing you want to, them to do is to construct their arguments and then you want to use evidence to support that and so basically and you can do this as a classroom or you could do this individually is you want them to start looking at the other arguments and one thing you have to put aside in science is your ego you don't have to be you don't want to be so um, attached to a answer or to your guess that so you aren't willing to look at other uh, evidence. And so basically this is a great activity you could start with in the elementary levels, uh, having them put forward a guess and then kind of argue on the evidence. So um, maybe this person says that this one's going to arch out farther because it has more time or this one may be that it's going to squirt out farther, farther because it has more energy or there's more gravitational energy on it. And so what is the right answer? Well, a great way to do this is to actually do science it in. Uh, fill up one of these containers with water, pop three holes in it, and then you could pull the tape off that's kind of keeping that water inside there. And what you'll find is the right answer is C. But that's less important than this whole process of putting forward an uh, explanation and then arguing on that. And then the last one is the idea of peer review. And so we really need our science students to understand that the way science works is people gather evidence, they come up with explanations, and then they publish that. 
to be published, you have to get in a journal and there's this whole peer review. And so that's how science is made. That's not how bad science is made. That's how science is made. And so these famous articles appeared in Nature magazine, which is one of the most famous uh, uh, scientific journals, but each of them had to be peer-reviewed before they were actually published. And so argumentation is not a bad thing. It's a wonderful thing. It makes science better. It makes engineering better. And I hope that was helpful.